Final Fantasy, Square's golden goose that has somehow lasted from the early days of JRPGs to the present day, all the while maintaining large amounts of relevance. It's really a feat not many other series have achieved, with most having one hit, then fading away into obscurity. But it's not like Final Fantasy was always successful. In fact, it's practically tradition for the franchise to severely wound itself, only to get right back up again. Though with 15 numbered main installments under its belt as of now, and technically even more if you count sequels, expansions, and side games. Just how has a series with this much within it almost ended for good? Hello everyone, this is the RPG Monger, and whether you're a longtime fan of the series or just know it as that thing my cringy ass weird bad avatar originates from, let's not only delve into the history behind the series, but go into the many times Final Fantasy has almost been final. So going back to the beginning of it all, before Final Fantasy was even conceived, let's talk about the company that created it, Square. Our story begins in 1983, when the company wasn't even a company, but a computer software division of Denyusha, a power line construction company owned by the father of Square's founder. Initially making money by renting computers, Square wasn't like many of the other big up-and-coming companies of that decade, as they didn't really have much of a history in anything else backing them, aside from their initial parent company, but that wouldn't last for long. You see, what set the fledgling company aside from all the rest of the early 80s was its actual approach to making games. Since normally when it came to development back then, you'd only have a single programmer working on most aspects of a game, Masafumi Miyamoto, Square's founder, believed the work should be split up within a small team, with different people specialized in a certain thing handling that aspect of the development process. Heading forward with that train of thought, Miyamoto would hire a small team to begin creating games with, most notably being two university students named Hironobu Sakaguchi and Hiromichi Tanaka, two names we'll be hearing a whole lot more throughout this video. So with its ragtag team assembled, in 1984, Square would put out its very first game, The Death Trap, a text adventure computer game that while not garnering too much attention, did receive enough for Square to immediately give it a sequel. Two games that not only provide a foundation for the soon-to-be independent company, but a bit of innovation as well since they'd be one of the very first text adventures to have bitmapped graphics on screen alongside the text. So in turn, after continuing to make PC games and dipping its toe in the water with console games, Square would take what staff had remained on the team and spin off of Denyusha, going fully independent. At this time, Sakaguchi, originally only being a part-time developer at Square, would become the director of planning and development, dropping out of college to work at Square full-time. Everything was looking pretty great, with the company never having experienced any sort of failure just yet. However, However, that soon changed in a flash. Right out of the gates, Square did not get off to a great start. After mostly putting out PC games with the exception of one, Square decided to double down on console gaming and focus a majority of their efforts on that section of the market. And in doing so, in the span of little over a year, Square would pump out a whopping 15 games, mostly on the Famicom, all of which barely garnering any major success. Definitely not enough to keep a new company afloat. So after barely being in independent for over a year, Square had reached an ultimatum. With only enough resources to make one more game, they would have to either somehow make a smash hit and survive solely off of it, or make another flop and go bankrupt. Now of course, as we all know, by some miracle the former would occur, with Square's A-team led by Sakaguchi creating Final Fantasy, a game whose existence was ironically enough owed in part to Dragon Quest, as it had shown Square's skeptical executives that fantasy RPGs could achieve widespread success. Not to mention, due to Nintendo's then-aggressive marketing tactics in the West, even its localized counterpart would do well. So in turn, with Final Fantasy's unprecedented success, things weren't so final anymore for Square, as they'd immediately set out to give it a sequel, completely reviving the company. And with that sequel coming out almost exactly a year after the first game to even more success, it'd be pretty safe to say that Final Fantasy had escaped the fate of being a forgettable one-off, lost 
the sands of time. Moving past the shaky origins of the series, let's jump ahead a couple years to the 90s, where Final Fantasy would rise to insane heights. You see, once Square realized just how popular Final Fantasy could be, they immediately made it their flagship series, giving it a variety of sequels, each more successful than the last. I mean, hell, by the time they got to Final Fantasy VI in 1994, the series was becoming quite the worthy contender for its initial inspiration turned rival, Dragon Quest. Not outselling it just yet, but getting closer and closer with each successive installment. Plus, as a company, Square could not be doing any better. Having risen past the days of solely relying on Final Fantasy, the company had now begun to branch out, making other new games that'd be pretty successful as well. However, it'd only be in 1997 when Square would truly hit the jackpot with Final Fantasy VII, a game spread across three discs for the PS1 that would not only go on to sell nearly 10 million copies, but truly put Final Fantasy on the map as THE JRPG to play. At this point, Final Fantasy couldn't be thriving more, seemingly unstoppable even into the year 2000, as ever since 7's overwhelming success, it'd be pretty much ensured that any Final Fantasy following it would do well, for better or for worse as we'll see later. I mean really, with how good Final Fantasy was doing, there's barely anything that could ever take it down. It'd have to be something monumental, something the company would bet on doing amazingly only for it to flop tremendously. Now I wonder what could do that. Alright, here we go. So before we talk about this thing, let's rewind a bit. Back in 1997, right after Final Fantasy VII came out and Square was doing better than ever, they decided to create Square Pictures, the company's very own movie studio. You see, the original plan was, parallel to Square making games, Square Pictures would be working on computer animated movies inspired by those games, and as they made advances in that field, those advances would be then incorporated back into the mainline games, generating a creative cycle of sorts. In turn, soon after the studio was formed, it start working on its very own Final Fantasy movie, which honestly, in concept, was kind of perfect. I mean, by then, the Final Fantasy games had already taken quite a cinematic tone themselves, what with the large amounts of CG cutscenes packed into each game starting with 7. And it's not like this mysterious Final Fantasy movie was just some side project Square didn't care about. They really funneled all they had into it, totaling at around 137 million dollars. It showed, too, because for the time, Final Fantasy The Spirits Within looked incredible. Having taken a combined 120 years of work across the 200-person team that created the movie, there really was no reason why the movie wouldn't be fantastic. That is, until you look at the director of the film, Hironobu Sagaguchi, the same man who was responsible for Final Fantasy in the first place. Having directed the first five games and created the story concepts for 6 and 7, Sakaguchi Sakaguchi had become something of a legend for his achievements, and at first glance, seemed like a perfect fit to direct the very first movie based on the series. Though as it become apparent in a couple years, his skill when it came to directing games wouldn't translate all that well when it came to film. Because while on a visual and technological standpoint the movie was state of the art, when it came to the overall plot, things were a bit more than lackluster. In fact, since we're already talking about it, let's touch on the story of this movie. To summarize, Spirit Within takes place on a post-apocalyptic Earth where humanity has retreated to large barrier cities to hide from weird ghost aliens called Phantoms. However, not all hope is lost because of the main character, Aki, and her mentor, Dr. Sid, who is legitimately the only Final Fantasy thing about this movie, have come up with a plan. Basically, to negate the Phantoms, Aki sets out on missions to collect the eight spirit signatures from the planet, with the movie opening when she obtains the sixth one. On paper, it's a plot that could have potential if handled correctly, but from the start on, it only falls deeper into cliché. Like the main conflict, for example, as Aki goes around getting the spirits within, bootleg Wesker over here, leader of the big bad military, just wants to use his space laser to get rid of the phantoms for good, possibly sacrificing the planet in the process. And well, that's about it, really. As far as sci-fi plots go, it's one of the blandest I've ever seen, period. Though while many saw 
saw the movie anticipating a plot on par with their favorite Final Fantasy, it'd be the aforementioned visuals of the film that would be its saving grace, with most of the favorable reviews focusing on that aspect of it. But unfortunately, as much time, effort, and money was put into making this movie be the best it could be, Final Fantasy The Spirits Within would flop horribly, resulting in a roughly $94 million loss. As a result, in the following years, Square Pictures would close operations entirely, with any remains being absorbed back into Square, not able to recover from the massive failure of Spirits Within. Funnily enough, before the movie crashed and burned, the main character of the film, Aki Ross, or rather her character model, was to become the very first virtual actress of sorts, with plans for her to reappear in future Square movies and more. Of course, that fell through pretty fast, but it's really interesting looking back and seeing what could have been had the movie actually done well. Though now, going back to Square and the mainline Final Fantasy games, things weren't looking too great. Having already not done very well in 2001, the failure of Spirits Within was the last thing Square needed, putting not only the company in jeopardy, but all its games as well. As a result, to save Square from spiraling further into the abyss, they'd end up asking Sony for a capital injection to patch their losses. And thankfully, Sony would accept buying an 18% stake in the company, but even though they were safe for the time being, Square's reputation as a whole would take its first serious blow. However, on the bright side, soon after The Spirits Within was released, so was Final Fantasy X, another game that proved to bring a large amount of success to the franchise, regarded by many to be one of the best games ever made, which in favor of the series would definitely prove to shift people's attention off the movie's incredible failure. Unfortunately though, Square's finances wouldn't be the only thing to be affected by their recent string of loss because as a result, the company's president would be replaced, with the new head, Yoichi Wada, causing Square's fundamental values when it came to creating games to shift. Like you all know, initially, Square's core idea when it came to development was devoting a singular dev team for each game. Well, with the coming of Wada, that would be no more, as now, devs would be split up into set divisions, with the idea that each division would benefit the other. On paper, it sounds like a fine idea, until you learn that the true motive behind this move was for devs to start reusing titles they've already developed to make the process as a whole cheaper. Something that wouldn't adversely affect Final Fantasy initially, but over time would begin to lead in a noticeable drop in quality, starting with the infamous sequel to Final Fantasy X, Final Fantasy X-2. However, let's not get too ahead of ourselves here. Before we go any further, let's touch on Final Fantasy XI, since while it wouldn't spell doom for the franchise, it'll be important later on. In fact, all things considered, Final Fantasy XI would become one of Square most successful ventures at the time. Coming out just a couple weeks before all the restructuring began, in general, Eleven was a highly anticipated game, since not only would it be the very first MMO in the series, but it'd also be one of the very first cross-platform MMOs, period. Of course, to achieve this, it needed to be accompanied by the PS2 hard drive add-on, which led to the game's initial sales not being the best, but over time as five more expansions came out, it eventually become pretty big. So big, in fact, that that in 2012, Eleven would become the most profitable Final Fantasy to date, eclipsing all the other games in the series at that point. Though let's pause on Eleven for a moment. We're not done with it yet, as it'll become really relevant with a certain other MMO, but for now, let's go back to the status of Square for a bit. Or rather, Square Enix, because in 2003, only a month after the release of 10-2, Square would merge with its longtime competitor, Enix, the company behind Dragon Quest among other things. It'd be a merger that rock the industry and leave many onlookers worried about how the company's respective games would be impacted. Though before anything else, why did it happen? I mean, when looking at both companies, especially back then, they were polar opposites. Enix being more of a game publisher than anything, with most of their best series having development outsourced to other companies, and Square doing everything in-house. But even with all their differences, the answer was pretty obvious money. Since as a result of the merger, Square would gain connections to the developers Enix outsourced to, and Enix would gain Square's foreign presence. In actuality, talks about merging had began as early as 2000, with Enix not going through with it earlier due to Square hemorrhaging money after releasing a certain movie. Though with them taking a hit themselves with the delays of Dragon Quest VII among other things, in order for either company to survive in the ever-growing market of games, they needed to band together. So moving past that massive change, for a brief couple of years, Final Fantasy would go on relatively 
relatively unaffected by the massive changes within Square, as not only would Final Fantasy XII do pretty good, but all the spin-offs within the series were prospering too. However, a bit before XII, Final Fantasy would begin to take its first steps towards its future Dark Age, all starting with their most popular game, Final Fantasy VII. You see, with Square's new business model, whenever something did good, they'd do everything in their power to milk it dry, even if the original success was more than a decade old. So even though the original game had come out seven years ago, Square Enix would begin to work on the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, a multimedia project that expand on Seven's overall universe with three new games, a full-on movie, and an OVA packaged with that same movie. Hearing all that, I'm sure the burning question on all of your minds is, was it any good? Well, to be honest, it kind of depends on what angle you look at it from. On one hand, yeah, it would produce some alright stuff, with the final entry Crisis Core turning out to be a fine prequel, and I'm sure before Crisis was good too, though it's a mobile game that never came to the West. But on the other hand, you'd have crap like Dirge of Cerberus, an uninspired third-person shooter sequel to 7 that end up getting most of its sales just because it had Final Fantasy 7 plastered on the cover. And then on yet another angle, there's Advent Children, a sequel movie that while is absolutely better than Spirits Within, was met with a mixed reception, being improved upon with the director's cut released a couple years later. All in all, at this point, it was clear to everyone that the square of old had permanently changed, and from here on out, for better or for worse, we'd be getting something entirely different. I mean, just take the 13s. Square Enix's newest main installment for Final Fantasy that'd be the most mixed reception to a main series project yet, splitting the fanbase directly down the middle with some lauding it as the best yet and others saying it'll kill the franchise. Both of them unsurprisingly wrong. This time, getting two sequels, the Final Fantasy 13 series of games would still do surprisingly well for the reception they'd get, edging Final Fantasy even more towards a direction that soon spelled demise. And with that, we move on to the Calamity. Going back a bit, meanwhile the 13s were coming out, the state of the series was beginning to turn sour. Sure, 13 had done pretty well, and Final Fantasy was still earning Square Enix a good amount, but behind the scenes, things were crumbling, the next two mainline Final Fantasies being an absolute disarray. Though for the sake of keeping things in order, let's start with Final Fantasy 14. Back in 2005, as single-player Final Fantasies kept doing whatever the hell they were doing, Final Fantasy 11 was doing pretty good, with a steadily growing player base that showed Square that MMOs weren't all that bad of an idea. So of course, since they knew 11 wouldn't last forever, even though it technically would, they'd begin production on a new Final Fantasy MMO. The team was comprised of a lot of veterans from 11's development, and even the producer from 11, Hiromichi Tanaka, who you may remember as one of the earliest members of Square way back when, was the initial producer of 14. However, what looked to be top-notch on the surface was a loosely strung together dev team inches from crumbling. Let me explain. Remember how a couple years back Square decided to change its game development process to be more division oriented? Well much like that, the development of 14 would also be split up into little divisions, some working on the best graphics they could make and others working on the best battle system they could make. All parts that went separate appeared to be satisfactory, but when put together resulted in a disaster of an MMO. You see, with many of the devs throughout the teams having worked on previous projects like 11, 14 to them was just another 11. And as a result, the initial attitude towards its development was, oh, this all worked before with 11, why do anything different with 14? And to be fair, sometimes an attitude like that can work when developing something like a single player RPG. However, MMORPGs are a completely different ball game that constantly evolve and change throughout the years, something the original dev team was too stubborn to realize until 
until it was far too late. I mean, just look at World of Warcraft. Coming out two years after Eleven, it revolutionized the MMORPG scene and firmly implanted what an MMO should be like in the minds of thousands. So of course, with the dev team making an early 2000s MMO set to release in 2010, the closed beta would really start to show the dev team just how flawed their game was. Now I won't list off every single problem with Final Fantasy XIV 1.0 as it double the video in size, but just to name the most notorious ones, for starters, the actual UI itself was atrocious. With most actions taking way longer than they should, things as simple as equipping gear would be tedious, requiring macros or commands just like they did in Eleven. Leveling, something that makes up one of an MMO's most basic components, was initially heavily limited and convoluted, penalizing those who want to grind through quests and other aspects to level up by only allowing players 8 battle leaves every 48 hours. Ironically enough, even though they were clearly trying to make the game similar to how Eleven was, it actually ended up worse. Literally the only way you could grind in the game was just by fighting random monsters in the overworld, though if you managed to get some good time into grinding due to the moronic fatigue system slowly reducing the XP you gained the longer you grinded, it was all just one massive waste of time. And that's just the surface of it all. Just take something as simple as gear durability. When 1.0 was first opened to the public, players would be disheartened to notice gear seemingly breaking at random. This was because while durability did exist, there was absolutely no way of checking how close something was to breaking. I'm not joking. Even crafting and gathering, something that's usually a simple side activity, was needlessly stretched out and convoluted. Essentially, even by the time 1.0 went into open beta, the game was frankly unfinished. Things that had become staples in MMOs since 11 were completely absent, like stuff as simple as jumping, leading to the game being littered with invisible walls. Hell, you couldn't even walk off small ledges or swim in water. In Final Fantasy XI, aspects like those were just accepted or tolerated, since that was how MMOs were back then. But when met with these aspects in a time where other modern MMOs had long cast them aside, players were rightfully mad. Though I've only talked about the gameplay of 1.0, let's also touch on its visuals because my god, how could they screw this up so badly? Like the gameplay, the graphics of 1.0 were really inconsistent with some assets like flower pots infamously having as many polygons and shaders as a player model. As a result, with the game engine not being able to handle such detailed models alongside players, you'd only be able to see a heavily limited number of players in a location at once, something that for an MMO is extremely counterproductive to the very point of playing one. Plus, with the loosely strung together system of scripts the game ran on, many actions like just trying to select something out of a menu would take twice as long as they do in anything else. With with many people having the game straight up crash their computer. It really was a mess, with the game's open beta being pushed back to only a month before launch. Though crazily enough, even now when the game was clearly a terrible product, there'd still be people in the team who thought the game would do fine. A stance that wouldn't remain for long, because once the open beta ended and 14 was fully released, the game was eaten alive. Alongside all the issues I mentioned and more, the truth of the matter was 1.0 just didn't have a lot of content for a brand new MMO, and what content there was, was needlessly drawn out to give the illusion of substance. But even then, when 1.0 was first released, it did make a good bit of money, what with many going into it expecting a finished game. Though that wouldn't last for long, because once word spread about how bad 1.0 was, not only would the game start to do worse, but the entire Final Fantasy brand as a whole would be pretty tarnished. Even critics, who'd consistently rated Final Fantasy games relatively high, even when audience reception was mixed at best, would bomb this game into the ground. If anything, the game's only saving grace was its cutscenes and music, since surprisingly, they'd actually gotten Nobuo Uematsu to compose a good portion of the soundtrack, giving players some good music to listen to while the servers would spontaneously combust. Point blank, 1.0 was a much-needed wake-up call for the Final Fantasy series as a whole, showing just what will happen when arrogance gets too out of hand. However, all that being said, what would happen happen next. The game's issues were far too great to just simply fix through patches, and with every month of it being out, more people were losing trust in the series. Well, thankfully, not all hope was lost, because we still haven't introduced the hero of this story. Enter Naoki Yoshida. Originally working as a game designer for the Dragon Quest series, once Square Enix realized just how grave of an emergency 14 was in, they created an emergency task force within the company to resolve it. Yoshida, at 
at its head. You see, unlike the original director of 1.0, Yoshida had actually played other MMOs and knew how games within the genre were supposed to be. In turn, as he'd show just how capable he was for salvaging 14, Yoshida would straight up replace the original director and get to work. Though just how do you fix a game that's so fundamentally flawed that even its very engine was reused from previous single-player games like 13? Well, you don't. That is, not in the typical way you'd go about fixing things. After Yoshida had completely assessed how grave the situation was, he'd realize there was only one way to truly fix the game and regain the lost trust of its players. Completely remaking it from the ground up. Basically, without announcing anything to players until it was the right time, Yoshida planned to patch as much garbage out of 1.0 as possible, all the while completely remaking the MMO into an actually enjoyable game. And just as a side note here, it's really crazy seeing the kind of stuff Yoshida had to patch in. Like seriously, when 1.0 first came out, you couldn't even write chocobos. So moving forward, as the months turned to years, 1.0 slowly evolved from an unplayable mess to something of an okay product considering how terrible it was at launch. Though aside from everything that was removed and added, there'd be one small detail that'd begin to grab players' attentions. In the sky, barely noticeable at first, was a tiny red dot, slightly growing in size with every patch. As more people began to take notice, rumors began to spread within the community as to what this mysterious stellar object could be. And finally, as the final patches dropped, it was clear that 1.0 wouldn't just be replaced, it was going to be annihilated. With the massive red moon Dalamud clear in the sky descending towards Eorzea, it'd create an atmosphere in the MMO like no other. By now, information about 14's reincarnation, A Realm Reborn, had been officially announced, and finally, after countless days and nights put into making 1.0 better, instead of plummeting, its player base had actually begun to rise. In turn, once the fateful day arrived where 1.0 would finally meet its end, I'd honestly say it's one of the most incredible ends an MMO has ever received. Dalamud now dominating the sky, all overworld music swapped with an ominous song, and all across the game, devs spawning incredibly strong hordes of monsters to make everything more apocalyptic. Even now, many still remember the iconic moments from 1.0's final day, and once the servers went offline for the final time, all players would be shown an incredible CG cutscene, showing the grim fate of Eorzea and what would happen to their characters. And thus, a bit under a year later, Final Fantasy XIV A Realm Reborn would release in full, an essentially completely new MMO made in only three years. A far cry from its predecessor, 2.0 would be received really positively, selling incredibly well. Once again, Final Fantasy had been saved, this time all thanks to Yoshida. And that's not just hyperbole, it unironically saved the franchise, what was Square Enix as a whole doing incredibly poor in 2013, at risk of going under if met with yet another failure. In all honesty, the whole closure of 1.0 and release of 2.0 was the most Final Fantasy thing the series had done in a while, reviving a lot of interest in the series that 1.0 had killed. But it wouldn't end there, because once 2.0 was released, the team would already begin planning the first expansion, releasing five patches until then, only bolstering the already successful game. Hell, as time went on and 14 released its expansions, from Heaven's Ward to Stormblood to now Shadowbringers, the game has grown to incredible proportions, with the active player count when Shadowbringers launched surpassing 1 million. Not to mention at the time of recording this, Final Fantasy 14 has become the second largest subscription MMO period, on track to becoming number one if it keeps up this pace. Like a phoenix rising from the ashes, 14 has had a revival like no other, going from disaster to quite possibly one of the best Final Fantasies I've played in a long time with Shadowbringers. Though don't take my word for it, because as of now, it's become the highest rated Final Fantasy in 13 years. And as an avid fan of the series, it absolutely deserves it. All in all, a pretty happy ending to such a chaotic story. If only I could say it ends there. No, no. Even though 14 has become a shining beacon for the entire series, it wouldn't be the only mainline title to threaten the very series itself. Since as 14 was developed, killed, redeveloped, and brought back better than ever, there'd be another game suffering a different kind of hell. Enter Final Fantasy XV.
Going back yet again to the mid-2000s, not very long after 1.0's development had began, development for a new Final Fantasy would start. Except initially, it wasn't a mainline entry at all. Instead, Final Fantasy XV was originally a spin-off planned for the PS3 called Final Fantasy vs. XIII. You see, at the time, with the compilation of Final Fantasy VII all but over, Square Enix set its sights on creating a new interconnected project similar to the compilation. And thus, Fabula Nova Crystallis Final Fantasy was born. A definitely bizarre chapter in the history of the series, this subseries wouldn't really work in the same way the compilation did. In contrast, rather than being connected via an overarching narrative based on something already established, Fabula Nova sought to do something a bit different, connecting games taking place in different universes through an overarching theme and mythos, all starting with Final Fantasy XIII. Backing the project, you would have a good amount of notable figures within Square Enix, the director of Final Fantasy VI, VII, 8, and even Chrono Trigger to name one. To call it ambitious would be an understatement. Simply put, Fabula Nova was planned to be the new cash cow, something new for Square Enix to milk, what with its previous successes all but worn out. However, what exactly was the so-called mythos that connected all the games? Well... This is where things get confusing. To summarize it all, the Fabula Nova mythos is pretty much a Final Fantasy Bible. No, I'm not kidding, that's what it was. Consisting of a pretty typical Greek-esque creation story involving gods betraying each other all leading up to the creation of the world and humanity, originally planned to be spread across the 13 games, Final Fantasy Type-0, and the mysterious Versus 13, things would immediately begin to go wrong. Because since this new subseries kind of relied on 13 success, to generate interest with Fabula Nova's other entries, the game's rocky release and mixed reception would not give the subseries a very great start. Not to mention alongside 13 itself being delayed, the two other games planned, Agito 13, later becoming Type-0, and Versus 13 would be as well, hurting the subseries even more. Though speaking of Versus 13, let's go back and see how it's doing. Well, not too great. Before talking about the actual people involved with the project, let's first touch on Crystal Tool. Square Enix's custom game engine infamous for the disaster of 1.0. For starters, one of the main reasons 13 would be delayed aside from internal squabbles within its development team was due to just trying to make Crystal Tools work. And as a result of the company delegating a majority of its resources into getting 13 out the door, Versus 13 would be heavily neglected, its team barely making any progress over the course of multiple years. In fact, as 13 struggled with its development, the original plan to develop both games simultaneously was all but discarded, with 13 even taking members off the team of Versus 13 to help out. However, what about when 13 was finally released? Would Versus 13 then be revived as planned? Unfortunately, not yet, because after 13 was released in 2009, 1.0 would drop in 2010, causing such an emergency within the company that developers from pretty much every team were recruited to help in some way, shape, or form. So then, what about after that crisis? Well, kind of. You see, ever since its initial announcement in 2006, where the director admitted little to no work had been done on the game proper at that point, Versus 13 had grown to pretty massive proportions, with things like a massive open world planned. But to everyone's dismay, Crystal Tools was just not strong enough to handle the now monstrous spin-off. Thankfully though, by now Square Enix had learned from its previous mistakes what with the company still reeling from 1.0, and so, instead of trying to cram Versus 13 into the cramped Crystal Tools, an entirely new engine would be commissioned to make sure Versus 13 wouldn't drag the company down even further. Though that wouldn't be the end of Versus 13's setbacks, because as a result of the game's development taking so long, it was now about to be left behind by an entire console generation, what with the PS4 and Xbox One advancing in development. So in turn, as its surroundings changed and left it behind, Versus 13 would have to change too, leaving the shadow of Final Fantasy 13 to become Final Fantasy 15 and 2012. A big step for the project, no doubt about it, as now, the days of being the neglected child of the franchise were no more. It had become a full-on, numbered Final Fantasy. And with that, for better or for worse, came the direct attention of Square Enix. Not to mention with it becoming 15, a lot of its ties to the mess that was the Fabula Nova subseries would begin to fade. Up until now, Versus 13 hadn't been much more than a sort of leech on the company, barely showing any signs of progress, all the while encountering 
no shortages of issues. So before anything else, what with the game now being in the company's spotlight, the first thing to change would be the people involved. And on that note, let's talk about them. More specifically, the initial director of 15, Tetsuya Nomura. Now Nomura is an interesting fellow. Having roots in Final Fantasy as far back as 4, he'd contribute quite a varied array of things to the series, from Shadow and Setzer in 6, to the character designs of Final Fantasy 7. And outside of Final Fantasy, Nomura was also responsible for Kingdom Hearts, another massively popular series by Square Enix. Basically, more often than not, he's behind a lot of the big stuff Square Enix puts out, and has shown himself to be pretty capable. Though when it came to Versus 13, things were a bit different. Over the years that Versus 13 had been under development, alongside Square Enix barely giving it attention due to 13 and the 1.0 dumpster fire demanding their attention, Nomura would change the main story of the game around a lot. At one point, even wanting to make the game a full-on musical, look it up, I'm not kidding. As a result, when Square Enix directed its focus towards 15 and added new people to the dev team, most notably Hajime Tabata, a variety of positions would be swapped, with Tabata eventually outright replacing Nomura as the game's director. You see, by now the year was 2013, and with Square Enix on the brink of failure, they had run out of patience with 15's extended development. I mean hell, by the time Tabata came on, the game was apparently only around 25% done. But who even is Tabata? Was he just as capable as Nomura? Well, not exactly. Unlike Nomura, Tabata had far less experience when it came to both Final Fantasy and directing in general, with the four things he directed ranging from pretty alright with Crisis Core to awful and weird with Third Birthday. However, that wasn't what Square Enix was looking at. Instead, it more came down to the fact that Square Enix wanted Nomura for other things, taking him away from 15 to work on Kingdom Hearts 3 and the newly greenlit Final Fantasy 7 remake. So now, with a far less experienced director at the helm for 15, what would happen to the past seven years of development? Unfortunately, a good bit. Take the story for example. Once Tabata and his team got a hold of it, only certain parts would be picked out while others would be simply discarded, leading to 15 vastly changing from its Versus 13 vision. Plus as a fun little bit of trivia, when Tabata and his team were first being brought into 15, the game had garnered such a terrible reputation throughout the company that the majority of his team didn't even want to work on it, being forcefully dragged into the project. Though now, with the final big change in 15's development out of the way, for the next couple of years the game would finally start to take shape, only being delayed one more time before its long-awaited release in November 2016, a full 10 years since the original Versus 13 had started development. And well, for all that waiting, how would this new single-player Final Fantasy turn out? Like the other recent Final Fantasies, excluding the new 14 and its expansion, 15 would also receive a mixed response, with some praising the game for its main characters and their interactions, and others dismissing it due to its flawed battle system and poorly told story, both equally valid points. But even then, with the game selling just over 5 million units, it'd be considered by Square Enix a success. And that's a good thing too, since the company was using 15 to determine the future viability of the franchise as a whole. Plus aside from the base game, instead of getting a 15 2 and 3 like Nomura had originally planned, 15 would get multiple story DLCs, giving the characters some much needed fleshing out. And alongside those DLC, they'd even release a bizarre multiplayer DLC. DLC, which, to be frank, was more of a failed experiment than anything. Not to mention, two years after 15's initial release, there'd be Final Fantasy XV Royal Edition, a kind of half-season pass, half-expansion for the game that overall patch over some of the rougher points when it came to 15. Oh, and before we completely forget, whatever happened to Fabula Nova Crystallis? Wasn't 15 supposed to be a part of it like 13 and Type-0? Well, it originally was, but like I said, as time went on and the subseries proved to be less and less of a success, not remotely getting close to the draw that the compilation of 7 had, the final version of 15 would end up distancing itself from it. Unlike the 13s in Type-0, the Mythos would end up taking more of a backseat role in the game than anything, still retaining some elements from its Versus 13 days, but a far cry of what it was in 13 and Type-0. All in all, whether it be due to the turmoil Square Enix went through, or just the actual reception of the games themselves, Fabula Nova Crystallis would be more of a failure than a success marking a long and arduous 10 years for the franchise. The only question now is, what's next?
Thankfully, right now in 2019, Final Fantasy is actually starting to show some serious promise once again after all this time. Since with Fabula Nova seemingly over alongside work on 15 and its DLCs finished, or technically cancelled as Tabata left Square Enix, the company finally seems to be changing for the better. Because aside from 14 becoming one of the best entries in a solid while, the remake of Final Fantasy 7 is showing some real promise. Not to mention, aside from what we know for sure, it was announced that Yoshida is now working on a new main project alongside 14 for the next generation of consoles. Of course, there's a chance this won't be Final Fantasy at all, but a lot of the circumstances point towards it being a new entry in the series, maybe even Final Fantasy 16, which if it is, leaves me really hopeful what with how capable Yoshida would be for the task. Hell, it may be wishful thinking, but the way things are going, Final Fantasy may even enter a new golden age. In the end, all we can do is wait and see. So now, here we are. The story of Final Fantasy is definitely a cautionary tale to all, showing just how quickly things can crumble apart even when you've known nothing but prosperity. At the end of the day, if Square Enix could just realize that the key to success was just high quality games and not making some sort of reusable sub-series to latch onto until it burns out, then Final Fantasy may never come close to death ever again. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it, do subscribe! And today's cool thing of the day is Final Fantasy XIV. I'm sure you all saw that one coming. Now, I'll fully admit, though I was initially motivated to play XIV a little under a year ago to make some sort of video on it, this video being what that idea would eventually evolve into, I'd be seriously sucked into the game after playing it for a bit, putting more hours than I'd like to admit into the endless MMO time sink. I cannot stress enough how enjoyable this game is, with fun combat, incredible music, and an amazing story, this MMO has just about everything I've wanted out of a new Final Fantasy for so long now. Sure, it does start a bit slow, but mark my words, it's worth it for how much better this game gets. Plus, as of writing this, even that aspect of 14 is planning to be fixed. And hey, all that nonsense aside, you get to fight me in this game. If that's not a draw, then I don't know what is. Also, if you already play the game and happen to be on the server Genova, you'll probably run into me, as I still go on the game a good bit. Either way, if you have the time and money, give 14 a chance. You won't regret it. Though as a bonus cool thing of the day, if you still want to learn even more about the 1.0 disaster, check out Noclip's documentary on the subject. It goes extremely into detail and is just a really interesting watch. So that being said, I'm the RPG Monger, and don't forget that each and every one of you are fantastic.